Hi, this is Deepak and today's podcast, we're going to discuss the Edelweiss Bharat Bond ETF. This is a new product. We don't know what's happening. Why do we buy this? What's 7.5% for 10 years, 6.7% for 3 years? Is it tax efficient? Bunch of things. Aditya and I answer all your questions and tell you whether you should buy. Hello and welcome everyone to the Capital Mind podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit CapitalMind.in. And if you'd like to invest with us, do visit CapitalMindWealth.com. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as the basis for investment decisions. Clients of Capital Mind may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hey folks, welcome to the Capital Mind Podcast. This is Aditya and as usual, I'm here with the one and only Deepak Shanoi. So we'll be talking about the Bharat Bond ETF today. So Deepak, welcome to the show. Thanks Aditya. Lovely to be here. Lovely to talk about the new topic in town, the Bond ETF. Uh, We talk about bonds all the time. You've done a bunch of bond videos. So we are supposed to know a lot more of the topic. So uh, let's go on. I think we'll learn more during this podcast or during the creation of this podcast that we (laughs) had known about bonds earlier. So uh, let's uh, begin. Fire away. Yeah. So Deepak, uh, we'll start first with the what and the why. So I was watching Radhika Gupta's interview with CNBC and she made an interesting statement actually, I really liked it. So she said, Bharat bond matures and operates like a bond, is diversified like a mutual fund and trades on the exchange like a stock. Well, that's a very interesting way to put it. But still, let's not assume that the average investor knows what Bharat bond ETF is. So could you please give us a brief about it? So it's a very interesting way to put it. I just uh, will defer on the exact language because I think what it does is behaves and operates like a tradable fixed maturity product. So which means uh, you have fixed maturity plans from mutual funds which roughly do the same thing. But there are some restrictions in fixed maturity plans. Uh, Let me come back to that. So what happens is you know, you want to buy a fixed investment product like a fixed deposit. You go to a bank and you say, hey, what will you give me for three years? So the bank says, well, I'll give you 6.5%. And then you say, okay, fine, I'll give you my money for 6.5%. Boom, boom, that's done. But there are other companies like public sector enterprises like uh, REC or PFC or a bunch of uh, other PSU uh, enterprises, which are not banks. They also borrow money from the market. They bury, borrow it at a little bit higher than, say, a bank would offer you. And now you want to you want to lend to them because you're like, okay, that's a PSU that's owned by the government of India. It's uh, safe in my view, at least. So therefore, I would uh, be happy giving them money because they'll give me maybe 1% more than I would get in an equivalent fixed deposit from a bank so how can i do it right now uh you can't you can't really see much of uh uh uh, these bonds or or any fixed deposits trading or hanging around and many of them when they do they offer very low rates or they don't have enough volume for you to be able to buy enough of them for yourself Uh, so the way the government has tried to do this is structure it such that all of them can um issue bonds which is effectively borrowing It will be bought by this ETF. You buy units of this ETF and you can buy it on the exchange or you can buy it through a fund of funds approach. We buy a mutual fund. The mutual fund buys units on the exchange. Uh, uh, Then uh, the funds are used, the money, your money which is invested is used to buy bonds of not just one but maybe 15, uh, 12 to odd different issuers, which means it's not concentrated on National Highways Authority or Rural Electrification Corporation, but uh, about 12 different entities. Maximum that any entity can have is about 15%. And uh, what happens is, you know, those uh, bonds keep uh, paying interest. That interest is received by the ETF, not by you. Okay. The ETF receives the interest, reinvests it and buys more of the same bonds. And we'll come to, you know, how that mechanism works, but have more of the same bonds. And then it uh, will actually at the end of it, which is well, there are two bonds. One is 2023, one is 2030. On those dates, they will mature and your money will come back to you. So effectively, if you buy a bond right now in the uh, NFO, you will want to hold it till whichever maturity date you've bought for. Or in the middle, if you feel that I need the money, I want to get out of this right now, you can sell it on the stock markets 
or if you bought a fund of fund you can sell it back to the fund of fund itself and you will be able to exit but you may not exactly get the kind of return you're looking for if you don't wait all the way uh, or you may get a higher return i mean it just depends on the market but uh, this is a way for you to diversify your fixed income holdings and say longer term if i don't mind something like 7 to 7.5% uh, I want to lock in those yields where or close to those yields right now. That may be an interesting product for you to look at. Before we move on to uh, risks and other uh, things that we want to talk about Bharat Bond ETF, let me ask a very noob question. So we talked about funds of funds. Who should invest in the ETF and who should invest in funds of funds? Like we know basically the funds of funds, it's for people who don't have a DMAT account, but uh, still a lot of people want to know this. Yeah, they, I, I mean, the simple factor is when you buy it as an ETF. If you buy it in the IPO, you will get the ETF in your DMAT account. You can sell it directly from your DMAT account. Whereas if you buy the mutual fund, the mutual fund will then go and buy the ETF. Uh, the return that you get by buying the fund of funds can be substantially different because the expense ratio of, that means the expense, the mutual fund uh, itself will have a certain expense ratio. The ETF has very, very tiny. It's point. five bips for Bharat Bond, which is like which amazing. Is, uh, very, very tiny, right? So because it's like saying 5,000 rupees for one crore worth of investment. Exactly. It's a fairly uh, small sum. It may be even smaller than that. I mean, I don't uh, necessarily, uh, I'm not going to fixate myself on the value itself, but I'm saying that there are two layers. If you do the fund of funds, the fund of funds will have an expense ratio and then the ETF itself will have an expense ratio so they'll kind of add up if you use the okay, fund of funds. I get it. If you use only the ETF therefore you know but the ETF has other costs because if you get it in your DMAT account and you want to sell it there will be a DMAT charge for whenever you sell that typically is 15 to 25 rupees let's say you sell it on five days you'll pay 25 rupees into five let us say 125 so that's a that's a cost in a DMAT fund whereas there's no such cost in a uh, FOF simply put forget all those differences if you have a DMAT account and a trading account you want to buy it in the uh, DMAT mode so buy the ETF if you don't have any of these you don't understand what these mean and still want to participate do do the fund of funds it's the same thing full, nearly the same thing okay okay when we talk about bonds we primarily talk about three risks the credit risk interest rate risk and the liquidity risk now at the outset bharat bond etf takes care of the credit risk since it will only invest in AAA rated bonds of select PSUs, right? But then there could be possibilities where a, com where a government company gets downgraded and then the AMC will have to mark down. So this is not a zero credit risk option. But what about the liquidity risk? Will there be enough liquidity in the market? And finally, what about the interest rate risk? So there's two layers here or maybe three or four layers of questions. The first one is credit risk. We believe that all public service sector entities are risk-free. Yes. But they're not necessarily because we've seen government agencies in the past default or at least temporarily default. Maybe they didn't default eventually, but temporarily default. I'll tell you why it matters to you as an ETF holder. Now, if you're holding that bond to maturity, uh, in all probability, it's unlikely that the government company will default. But right. it could miss a payment in the middle. We've seen this happen in the past. And when it does, the rating agencies will downgrade it. If they do downgrade it, this particular ETF has to sell it. It is not, it is compulsory that once this bond falls off the investment of AAA uh, or maybe AA, I, I don't know what the top limit is, but let's say it falls off that limit, it's got to sell it. And if it does that, it's going to lose money in the process of selling. It's not going to hold that bond to maturity, even if there is a temporary missing of even one single payment by a PSU for even a reason that might be very ordinary in the course of business. The problem is that risk now transfers to you. As an ETF holder, it will hurt you. And uh, if it's a very very temporary thing like one or two days, then it's fine. It's probably something that will last three or four months. Then it will affect you definitely. Second part is the liquidity risk and the interest rate risk. Now, interest rate risk is like this. Today, interest rates are X. Tomorrow, interest rates are X plus 2% increases. Yes. Bond prices will fall by nature. But this affects you in one circumstance. If you want to get out in the middle, you'll find that the prices are lower than when you got in. So, you'll make a loss. Now, you have to offset that for the fact that these coupons will keep coming in, which means the interest rate. So if I take something at 7% interest in one year, my 100 rupees has naturally become 107 rupees. True. Then if the bond price falls back to 100, I've not made a loss. I've just lost the interest for a year. 
So in a way, I get protected a little bit from the interest rate risk by the fact that there's a coupon that's being earned during this process, and it's mostly an opportunity cost that might have uh, uh, gone uh, astray. The other thing is the interest rate can work in your favor as well, where the interest rates continue to fall and these bond prices increase. Now. As every day passes by, your interest rate risk decreases. Why? Because now we're closer and closer to maturity. True. So, if you're a 2023 bond uh, ETF, that uh, in 2020 the uh, there's a residual three years left. So, the impact of an interest rate hike will actually be quite dramatic. But in 2022. Two, if the interest rate goes up, you're most likely going to see almost no or little impact because only one year is left. And uh, when a bond is going to mature at, uh, you know, and going to pay you 106 rupees, uh, when one year ago uh, it was trading at, say, 100 rupees, if the interest rate goes up by 1% also, the if bond will fall to only maybe 99 rupees 50 paisa. I mean, it's just the way the, the bond reacts is going to be a lot lesser when it's only one year left to maturity versus when the three years left to maturity. So in this duration fixed ETF, there is no residual duration, which happens when you buy mutual funds in general, if you buy an ultra short term fund or, or say a short term fund, a short term fund has uh, about uh, say three years left. Uh, it will have three years left if you buy today. That is the way the bond is structured. But even three years later, it will have replaced some bonds with another set of bonds, which replay, which mature another three years later. So there's always a residual duration risk. Here there isn't one because the residual duration does not exist. The bond fund is not, ETF is not allowed to buy any bonds that mature after the maturity, maturity date of the ETF. So if okay. 2023 means 2023 is the maximum maturity you can have of any of the bonds held by the ETF itself, this saves you a little bit, allows you to build strategies that say, listen, I want something to mature at 2023. So, uh, you know, I'm going to park my money till then. So third part is liquidity risk. Again, this has two layers. First, the liquidity risk of the ETF itself. If a lot of people start buying the ETF, the market makers, which will come in and uh, provide them the liquidity. So they will sell them the units. Where will they get the units from? They will go to the ETF and say, listen, give me a unit. Now these market makers can buy from the mutual fund directly only if they have 25 crore worth of units uh, required. So okay. they have to give 25 crores, take 25 crores worth of units and then supply the market with those units. 25 crores is a lot of money. So when uh, they only when they see that kind of demand will they go in. And when you go in with 25 crores, what does the ETF do? It gets 25 crores of money. It has to now go and buy back bonds in the market of uh, the same PSUs, this 15% NHAI. What if those bonds are not available? The answer to that has been kind of sort of answered by Edelweiss by saying, listen, we've talked to the uh, PSUs and they will reissue to us as uh, the case may be under whatever SEBI regulations will apply because they may not be allowed to issue to us on an individual basis. They will have to do a public issue where other people are allowed to subscribe. But uh, we should be able to get some allocation out of that and we should be able to scale up. So it, it effect effectively says that they will use money to buy more and more of the same bonds. Okay. There's a liquidity issue there that they've solved in some way. There's another liquidity issue which is yours. As an ETF holder, if you want to sell, what exactly. if there's no buyer? Exactly. And that problem has been partially solved by them saying, listen, we've got a market maker or a set of market makers. One of them is an Edelweiss entity. One of them is a GM entity, I think. And they have identified these market makers to say, if somebody wants to sell, this market maker has to go and buy at some price. And if somebody wants to buy, this market maker has to sell at some price. Now, this price which is they, they give you is a bid and offer price. The bid price is the price at which they are willing to buy and the offer price is the price at which they are willing to sell. The market maker should be the best bid and the best offer. Effectively, that's what a market maker does. Now, if the issue is intensely liquid, that means I am buying, you're selling, and we can both trade with each other, the market maker is not required. True. It's only when there's illiquidity is the market maker is required. Now, market makers have a risk because tomorrow the bond goes down, the market maker will be sitting holding all that inventory and he can't get rid of it. So the answer to... Um, that would be then that, you know, people have to be liquid very fast. And then what the market maker will do if it's not liquid is that he will quote at a very wide spread. He will say, listen, if the price is 100, then I will give you a buy at 95. That means you can't sell to me. Um, you, you, you'll have to sell to me at 95, but you'll have to buy from me at 105. 
because i use that spread to offset my risk okay so i'll have to sell at a discount uh to sell at a discount buy at a premium so this happens in many etfs so if you see that defeats the purpose of buying this one. yeah so we've got a bunch of etfs that are currently listed on the exchange there's a bunch of etfs that uh, there's a, for instance lic gsec etf 6 8 months ago we noted this there was a 20% discount in the market that means people who were uh, selling were selling at 20% below the price of the uh, etf itself by the way the the etf will announce its price on real time basis on the edelweiss mutual fund page every it will day. be a, a page every day it will be refreshed every 5 or 10 seconds so you'll be able to see the exact real time nav that means what the underlying price should be that price could be 100 you might find that the market price is 98 which means it's trading at a discount you can be a buyer at 98 or it could be trading at 102 which means it there's a, there's a there's a premium so you could sell at 102 but you have to buy also at 102 which is a which is a secondary market uh, premium now we've seen a lot of etfs that sometimes trade at a premium sometimes trade at a discount we've seen as much as a 20 to 25% premium or a discount in many cases in the lic gsec etf we've seen a 20% discount the motilal nasdaq 100 used to trade at a 15% premium so these um, uh, values can vastly differ based on uh, liquidity and how the market makers perform so today both these etfs which i talked about just now have reduced in terms of premium and discount to the point where they're trading maybe 1% away from the price and 1% is a reasonable price to pay but um now uh, you shouldn't pay more than that so that's a liquidity issue that i think we will have and we have to see how this pans out although edelweiss has given us a lot of uh, confirmations that there will be more players here that will balance out the price we'll have to wait and see and that's a risk that we haven't yet uh, figured out so deepak you talked about reinvestment so uh, as we know that in in this case the etf holder won't be getting the interest so basically the amc will reinvest but my question is how how are they going to reinvest like is there uh, is there some sort of surety that they'll get enough triple a rated bond or can they go to double a as well so what we've heard so far is that the index the underlying index itself is constructed in a way that the entity has to continue to be a psu that it has to continue to have a triple a rating that uh, there should be no defaults therefore if there is a default it will go away and that it will be rebalanced every 3 months all these factors tell us that uh, there's one particular aspect of it that is a problem and we'll come to that perhaps the yield yeah. i mean how much return will you get but this particular aspect of liquidity is uh, based on a very particular uh, set of numbers now the way you look at it is you say okay i'm going to get 6.5% okay now how do you calculate 6.5% you say oh this bond yields uh 6% and it's valid for uh, till 2023 and some other bond is so there are 50 such bonds in each of these uh, in the, in each of these uh, ETFs that's a 23 one has bond. 50 bonds not all of the bonds mature on the expiry date of this 2023. 2023 they will some of them mature in april 2022 as well yes we saw that and uh, we did see that this aspect of it uh, has introduces another layer of of risk and i will come to that as well but because the, all of these bonds these 50 bonds may not all be available at the same time uh what edelweiss will have to do is go and talk to the issuers and say listen i want more of these bonds and please issue because i have btf investors waiting and those people will have to issue more bonds so there's an upper limit to this because at some point ntpc will say listen boss i don't care if your etf is getting so much money i am not issuing any more bonds because it's screwing up my debt ratio so at some point even the etf says listen i have the right to say i will not issue more units because i can't i mean if the underlying guys are telling me they don't want any more debt from me i can't keep issuing units so i have the right to say no so there is that liquidity extreme liquidity so if you think that everybody and his uncle is going to jump onto this bandwagon it's a risk to you not to uh, you know uh, the etf or to ndpc or to nhi so it's it's your risk that that happens well. so so you talked about the the uh, yield so the indicative yield for the 3 year variant is 6.69 and for the 10 year variant it's about 7.58 so since the bonds are of varying maturity what is the extent of variation we can expect in the actual yields so this is quite interesting because 6.59 is not fixed we know that for sure in this case 
but but you see when you buy a fixed maturity plan they'll give you an indicative yield and roughly after the mature the fixed maturity plan can only be subscribed to once okay and then it has to be held for 3 years it's it's supposed to be listed on the exchange but hardly any transactions happen but you can't enter it after the nfo date that means the new fund offer date after that you can't buy any more units uh, not from the fund house you have to buy so the etf you have to they, i mean this is for a fixed maturity plan okay. but i'm saying the etf is different in the sense you can buy more etf units on the exchange so there is a possibility that the etf can issue more units tomorrow True. whereas in a fixed maturity plan you have to issue the max all the units on the first date itself now when you issue all the units on the first date itself you know exactly how much money you have you can go to the issuers and say i have this much money exactly and i will i want a bond maturity exactly 3 years from now which gives me this uh, benefit and therefore you can time it and tell go back to investors and say listen we did all this and we've got a yield of 7.5% and you will get 7.5% okay. minus some transaction fees roughly that is how the structure works but in this bond etf it's not like that why because uh first of all there are new issuances that could happen because sure. uh more people can come in after the bond etf IP ipo which means after that day when the bond list uh, etf lists on the exchange more people can go buy in the exchange the market makers will then uh, fulfill those uh Uh, uh investors with units they will go back to the etf and say listen we want more units because people are demanding so much when the new units are created though that money is used to buy more bonds when they buy more bonds they could actually buy at a different yield so True. what is promised you at 6.5% by that time it could have become 6.1% or maybe so, 5.1% or maybe 5.5 so you eventually become pay get a lower yield so your average yield will change second this is based on an index that rebalances itself every 3 months which means after 3 months if there is one bond that has become gone from 15% of the index to 20% of the index the index will rebalance it back to 15% how does that mean for an etf oh i have bonds worth 20% i have to bring them down to 15% i have to sell, sell. 5% of those bonds and uh, i have to buy something else so i have to do this shifting in the market that activity itself creates some uh, issues and then you you may not get the exact prices that you would have thought you would have got secondly the the rebalance itself ensures that the effective yield you get will be very diff- will could be very different from the yield at the time that you entered which means 6.5% is not pakka third okay. thing is you've got these two factors that are that will harang uh, investors in terms of oh i'm not exactly getting this the third thing is a maturity date like you rightly pointed out some of the 2023 etf bonds mature in 2022 april that's one year prior True. to so if you're in a three year bond and something matures one year earlier one third of your yield is coming from an unknown point why because in 2022 when this bond matures i have to reinvest the money for one more year as an as an etf what will i do i will go to the market and buy whatever is available or the index will tell me what what i have to buy which, which is, is maturing on 23 23 so it will be a one year fixed deposit of sorts or a bond of sorts issued in or available in 2023 now even today a one year uh, bond of a psu is trading at maybe 5.8% So at that time, if it's trading at five point four percent, so you've got two years of a six point five percent yield, exactly. one year of a five point four percent yield, which means your blended yield of the period in consideration is lower. Now, luckily, there are fifty different instruments; they mature at different points in time. Some of them in April two thousand twenty-two, some of them in January two thousand twenty-three. So, blended-wise, the risk is a little bit lower, but there is a risk. That means six point five nine percent or six point six percent, which they have. suggested today is not going to be the yield you will get to maturity it will be different if you are a btf investor you need to understand that this variation is going to happen more on the 2023 bond than on the 2030 bond so i believe that the real bond here is the 10 year bond that the 3 year bond should not be bothered about it's only there because people want to use a tax arbitrage but the real value is in the 10 year bond lock in yields for 10 years if you fundamentally believe that interest rates will go down i think this is a great product to kind of lock in those yields because if all these risks i'm talking about liquidity i mean the risks that i've talked about liquidity about rebalancing about uh 
maturity matching is only Those, applicable if you want to exit in between right? in between is one layer but even if you held to maturity the yields would not be the same but it'll affect the 2023 bond which is the three year uh, etf a lot more than it will affect the 10 year etf the 10 year etf will have a much lower actual impact so you can say that the 7.5 percent i'm getting is more reliable as an indicator than the 6.5 they're telling us for the three year etf Okay, so let's come to the taxation part. So we know that FDs are taxed at your slab rate, but debt funds, if held for three years, are taxed at twenty percent with indexation benefit. Now my question is: Suppose I do not participate in the NFO, okay, but I buy the three-year variant after one year, and I hold it till maturity. So I won't get the twenty percent tax rate benefit, right? Even if I hold it till maturity, because I bought it after one year. So now, does it look attractive to me? So it's interesting because uh, then it becomes a two and a half year or two year product because if the bond is maturing in April twenty twenty three, you still have about four months to buy it in the exchange to continue to get the same indexation benefits. That means you have to hold it for three years. So if you have to buy it, you have to buy it before April twenty twenty, which is in the next three months. Uh, if you buy it in the next three months, you will get the same benefits as anybody buying in the NFO. That is for sure. Okay. But after that, you will not get the indexation at all because even if you held it for two years, you won't get two years of indexation because you have to hold it for a minimum of three years to actually get any indexation benefit because less than three years is a short term indexation. So then you will compare it directly with a fixed deposit and say fixed deposit giving me five percent here I'm getting six percent I will choose this because it's like a two year fixed deposit of public sector entities. If it is more than three, which is again why. the 10 year product is attractive because you don't have to rush to buy it in the next 4 months you can still you still yeah. have some time before yeah, yeah. this kicker you know kind of kicks in so the tax benefit makes a lot more sense to look at if you are looking at a longer term product where you're locking in yields and remember also that the tax benefit is very different for different people if you are in the 10% or less slab you probably don't care yeah, and true. in effect you don't may not want this product because there are other products like a ppf which is giving better more tax adjusted returns so you want to finish those avenues before you First, get to this yes. this product and um, uh, a 10 year product locked in at uh, 7.5 uh, percent is actually now comparable or close now to a ppf kind of a product so if you have the 10 year maturity in mind that is when you want to lock in for a longer term on these products you can buy it now and what's actually very beneficial is you should actually buy it in a kind of an sip mode if you are looking so for instance i am 45 and if i want liquidity when i'm 55 i can actually build towards it by buying uh, on a regular basis the ctf every month and that will give me a way to say listen i'll get a bunch of liquidity when i'm 55 and that may be the time when say my kids have grown up and left and i have this empty nest problem and i want to travel the world and i want a safe product to park my money in so that i'm sure i'll get that money at that time so good way to look at a product is it's going to give me liquidity in 10 years and i want some level of safety and i want some level of returns which i can kind of predict where nothing else exists in the 10 year time frame where you can predict it i would say this is a good product for those kind of people okay i know deepak you are writing a post on this so i am looking forward to that so uh, we'll close this discussion with one question who should buy according to you who should buy the 3 year variant and who should buy the 10 year variant i mean you already discussed it that uh, people who are looking for a uh, long term option can go for the 10 uh, year variant so i definitely think the 10 year variant is the most interesting because it gives you enough time you could actually balance between debt and equity like this say let's say i'm investing debt and equity i'll put 10% of my money in the 10 year bond a 10 year etf okay. and 90% in equity over time i will slowly take out money from the equity portion and start moving more and more to a debt product this is a way for me to construct uh, an avenue that says in the initial years i will be high equity and towards the later years i'll be higher and higher on debt simply because i want to ensure liquidity in the longer term so it gives my equity investment some time to perform so maybe 5 to 6 years and after that i get more and more into debt so it's useful to construct products like this and i hope they come out with variants like 15 years 5 years so we can build a ladder i could actually then tell people uh, eventually once the product ladder has been built up saying listen i will ensure liquidity for you every 2 years as an advisor i could actually build a product 
uh, portfolio that said uh, you want money when you're 44 for your kids education you want money when you're 46 for your uh, uh, for a certain holiday you've been thinking of or for you want money at the age of 57 when you're going to retire uh, we'll plan this out through a series of bond ETFs which all mature at that time fairly safe so I, I know this and I can reasonably or closely predict perhaps the kind of uh, yields that I might get so my, I can actually accurately plan and think that okay so I put 100 rupees how much will that actually become by that time roughly I don't need an exact number you don't want exact numbers if you want exact numbers go buy a fixed deposit or a fixed maturity plan because that's better but if you don't care about really fixed numbers, you don't mind a little bit of variation, you want some safety, you're looking at some layer of liquidity, which is that really some bad things happen in my life, I really want to be able to get out. Uh, this product is for you. And I think the 10-year product is far more interesting. The three-year product is, uh, well, it's there, it's going to be valuable for the next four months. After that, it's going to lose value. So in my mind, that does not form a great investment product because we'll talk about it in four months. It's like, oh, it's like just another fixed deposit because that is not so interesting for me. It's like, uh, if you want to park your money for exactly three years, now who knows that you need your money in exactly three years. Uh, I think three years is too short a time frame. True. Unless you're like 57 and saying, I want to retire at 60, then it makes sense for you. But very few people will have that problem. Other, other than that, I think if you have a 10-year runway to buy this product, this is great. Senior citizens should actually consider other schemes uh, before getting into this product. There is a PMVVY, there is a, a senior citizen savings scheme, both of which currently offer more than 8% or, or, or around, which they should exhaust. And that's like 30 lakhs per person that they should actually exhaust before even thinking of this. You, uh, For younger people, you have the PPF, which still continues to be attractive at one and a half lakhs a year. That should be your uh, uh, primary uh, you know, uh, parking place before you visit such things. This, that's just about as safe and it's directly from the government rather than going through a PSU uh, ETF. So once you finish those avenues, this is a great product to look at and you should look at maturity matching. You should look at a time frame that says this 10 year thing makes sense. And uh, add 10 years to your age. Would liquidity look good at that time? Is there a reason you want that liquidity? Then you should buy this product. Okay, awesome. Deepak, we had a great uh, discussion. I hope our listeners enjoyed it as well. So thanks a lot. Thank you for uh, answering all my questions. And I would like to thank our listeners as well. Thanks a lot for listening and thanks for thanks Aditya for all the questions. I think uh, as usual at Capital Mind underscore in on Twitter and I am at Deepak Chinoy uh, and uh, Aditya is at Astute Aditya. We would love to hear what you uh, uh, what questions you have. We've hoped to answer some of them in this podcast. We will answer more as we go by. Uh, CapitalMindWealth.com and CapitalMind.in are our websites. We run a portfolio management service where we uh, where we invest on behalf of our customers we also run uh, capitalmind.in where we provide information research uh, check us out tell us what you think thanks for listening thanks a lot <laughs>